Happy Friday, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security news each week and to sharing practical tips along the way. I'm your host and security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting February 2nd, 2015. Before I jump into today's video, a quick show note. A couple viewers out there mentioned that they prefer to catch up on their security news in one weekly video, and they don't necessarily follow the daily security bites. So rather than just pointing out each of the daily security bites, I'm actually going to play the full week back to back. That'll make this a little longer video, but don't worry, if you are watching the daily security bites, I'll also put a link. If you click here, it will skip straight to Friday's security bite. With that said, let's jump into the show. Today's story is a military information security honey trapping campaign. If you haven't heard of honey trapping, it's the act of using attractive women, whether they're pictures or real women, to get a victim to do something they shouldn't. According to research from FireEye, some pro-Assad uh, cyber actors used honey trapping to lure uh, Syrian rebel forces into getting infected with malware. Essentially, they had hang out on Skype posing as attractive women using pictures of attractive women to get a Syrian forces to talk to them. And when they did, they'd start to leverage this uh, connection to install malware on these forces and then steal seven gigabytes of information which included a lot of information that could help in military campaigns. The moral of this story is beware of hot girls on the internet. This sort of information attack campaign isn't limited to nation states. It's actually a very traditional technique that cyber criminals use all the time. If you get Facebook posts or, or things like that that seem to come from attractive people you don't know, chances are it might be a phishing technique used to lure you into doing something you shouldn't, and it might somehow somehow attached to an attack. So be careful out there and be skeptical of other people communicating with you in an anonymous fashion. Today's news is a zero-day vulnerability in Internet Explorer 11. On the full disclosure mailing list, a researcher posted a proof-of-concept demonstration showing a cross-site scripting vulnerability in IE 11 running on a fully patched version of Windows 8.1 and lower. Others have validated this vulnerability, including me. It really does work. In short, if an attacker can get you to click on a specially crafted link that seems to point to a site you trust, they can take advantage of this cross-site scripting vulnerability to do anything you would do on that particular site. So for instance, they can get you to click on what might look like a Gmail link and get access to your Gmail. It's unclear whether the researcher reported this to Microsoft, and it remains unpatched right now, so there's a little you can do to fix this vulnerability. That said, you can protect yourself by being careful of what links you click on. Attackers will most likely exploit this sort of flaw in a phishing attack, where they send you a link that seems to go to a site you trust, but really does something else. As you hover over these links, you might see that they're overly long. My recommendation is if you're clicking on a link in an email, say to Facebook or to Gmail, rather than clicking on that link, just go to the site directly instead. Today I'm talking about malicious applications on Android's Google Play Marketplace. This story comes from Avast Security's blog post, or rather, it really comes from one of Avast's customers. On Avast's forum site, this customer posted about malicious applications he found on Google Play, things like a card game named Dirac, an IQ application, and a history application. What was interesting about these malicious apps is that first they would lie dormant. They would just do what was advertised. But once you rebooted your Android device and then waited anywhere from 7 to 30 days, they would activate their malicious payload. They would essentially, every time you unlock your phone, they would force force you to a malicious advertisement web page that would pop up different types of pop-ups to get you to do something. For instance, they might try to get you to contact premium SMS
DNS services to monetize this for the criminal. So this is a very interesting example of malicious applications showing up on Google Play's real legitimate market. And what's more interesting is the evasive tactics and the delayed tactics that this mobile malware used to get past traditional mobile malware security solutions. Advast's mobile security product will now catch this, but it did evade both Google and Advast security filters at first. So what's the takeaway for any Android users out there? First of all, never download applications from third-party sites. It can be dangerous. However, as you can tell from this story, even Google Play sometimes gets infected with malware. So be careful of what you download from there as well. Maybe read the description of the product and look for any signs of unprofessionalism. Finally, if you're an Android user and you're not using some sort of local security uh, product on your device, you really should. You need something that might catch malware. By the way, if you're a WatchGuard customer and you use APT Blocker, do know we can scan APK files, which are Android installer files, for zero-day malware as well. Today's big news is a huge healthcare data breach. Anthem, which is the second largest health insurer in the US, has warned that external hackers stole 80 million customer records. And these records include things like your address, your name, your medical ID, your email address, and even your social security number. Now, Anthem doesn't think any credit card information has leaked, and they haven't said whether or not the hashes or, or password credentials have leaked. But in either case, your social security number is a pretty crucial piece of information. So this is pretty bad for Anthem customers. Now, so far, there's no word on how the attack happened, but we'll update you if we learn more. Meanwhile, what should you do about this? Well, if you're an Anthem customer, I highly recommend you take advantage of their free credit monitoring that they've offered. In fact, I'll post a link to their FAQ page where they give information to customers. Now, if you're an organization that stores data like Anthem, this sort of breach illustrates why you need defense in depth. You need many different security controls that can handle every part of the cyber attack kill chain. Things like intrusion prevention, antivirus, data loss prevention, reputation services, advanced threat detection, and many other security layers to block these sorts of attacks. If you're a WatchGuard customer with the UTM package, you already have that. However, you might also think about adding data loss prevention to your security arsenal. In some cases, attackers may be able to infect your network, but you can still stop them during exfiltration of data if you have things like data loss prevention, which can detect social security numbers, medical records, medical IDs, and other pieces of information in documents as they pass through your network gateway. So if you store customer data, consider data loss prevention. Today I want to talk about the latest Snowden leak, which is about the Lovely Horse GCHQ and NSA campaign. Basically, Lovely Horse is this campaign that the NSA and the GCHQ ran to follow the public Twitter feeds of well-known security researchers. If you read these articles, they talk about how the NSA wanted their analysts to know about the latest security news, so they followed some of the most well-known security researchers to look for pastebin posts and the latest intelligence. Now, why is this news? Why is this a big deal? I really don't get it for this particular Snowden leak. You know, I'm not really for a lot of the NSA and GCHQ spying tactics when they're actually snooping on private connections for many, many citizens, and some of the techniques they use to decrypt things or to do man in the middles seem pretty bad and dangerous to me. But there's really nothing wrong with security professionals following other security professionals on public mediums. For goodness sake, I follow half of those security researchers on Twitter because they share interesting information. So I really don't get what the big deal is about these latest Snowden leaks. Before I end the show, a few updates from the week. First, on the Anthem story from Thursday, shortly after posting that, we learned that the security group, Mandiant, that's investigating this particular breach, shared a few details. Basically, they say it's a sophisticated threat actor, as everyone expected them to say, and they say they know this because they used a custom backdoor. Now, this term, custom backdoor, is kind of deceiving. 
because really it probably was a well-known Trojan that was just altered into a new variant to get past traditional signature-based security. So I'm not sure a custom backdoor really means a sophisticated technique. The other news on the Anthem breach is some uh, folks from CrowdStrike, a security research firm, have already claimed that China's behind this. Now that may be true, but I kind of am suspicious of such a quick allegation and such a quick uh, attribution for this particular attack. The one final Final update, over the past few weeks I've been talking about a whole lot of Flash Zero Day. If you follow my Twitter you probably know there was a third Flash Zero Day. And this week Adobe released a bigger Flash patch that fixes a lot of vulnerabilities. If you use Flash you definitely have to get that. And if you use a Mac by the way they're disabling the Flash plugin in most of your browsers. So be sure to get that if you haven't gotten it. Well, that's it for this week, but there's a ton of other stories out there. Be sure to subscribe to our blog, which you can find at blog.watchguard.com or watchguardsecuritycenter.com. In the blog post associated with this video, I'll have a reference section that has links to all kinds of other stories. You can also follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. And don't forget to actually subscribe to my video channel if you want the videos as soon as I post them. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.